Hello and welcome. I'm Real Crowd CEO Adam Hooper, and this is the Real Estate Investing for Your Future podcast. Here we explore the latest in commercial real estate trends, insights, and investment strategies that passive investors can use to build real estate portfolios that last. All opinions expressed by Adam, Tyler, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Real Crowd. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. To gain a better understanding of the risks associated with commercial real estate investing, please consult your advisors. Our guest today is Cindy Chetty, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the National Multifamily Housing Council, known in the biz as the NMHC. The NMHC is the place where leaders of the multifamily industry come together to guide their future success. With the industry's most prominent and creative leaders at the helm, NMHC provides a forum for insight, advocacy, and action that enables its members and the communities they build to thrive. In today's conversation, Cindy gives us an inside look at what to keep an eye on in Washington, some upcoming policy changes, and how they might impact the multifamily industry. We hope you enjoy the show. All right. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us today. We are uh, very excited to, to kind of pick your brain on what's going on in, in D.C. And, and with legislation and regulations that are coming down the pipe. So we, again, appreciate you joining us today for the show. Great. Thank you for having me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, what you do at the National Multifamily Housing Council. Um, a lot of our listeners are familiar with at least the rent tracker. That was something that when we were doing our, our weekly newsletter, we were obviously tracking those numbers uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, but more broadly, why don't you start with what NMHC does um, and, and kind of how you got started with that organization? Great. So um, NMHC is a trade organization and we rep- represent the owners, operators, developers, managers, suppliers of the apartment industry. And what I am, am the senior vice president of the government affairs department. I have a staff of, of our department consists of 12 folks. There are seven, eight full-time lobbyists. And um, what we do um, in my department is we advocate on behalf of the industry. Um, I like to say to members of Congress when I'm talking about NMHC, there isn't much that they do in Washington that doesn't affect the industry. So Mm -hmm. we are engaged in any number of things. My background is I worked um, over 25 years on Capitol Hill. I made my way up through the, the ranks, started out as an intern and fell in love with the political process um, and ultimately went back after my freshman year in college, interning, um, changed my major and set off on a course of being involved in politics. Um, I started working for a number of different members. Um, my first um, real encounter though, Um, was with a member from New Jersey, a Northeast Republican. Uh, um, I don't know how much you know about um, a long time ago, but uh, Northeast Republicans (laughs) were were moderate Republicans. And so I worked, um, started out in that position as a legislative assistant, moved up to ledge director, and ultimately was the chief of staff for that member. Mm -hmm. And I was also responsible for working on the issues um, specific to the banking committee, and that included housing. So um, I cut my teeth and spent a good deal of time focusing on housing-related issues. Um, And I I worked for Mrs. Rockama, Congresswoman Rockama, for a good 20 years. And during that time, I also uh, moved over to the banking committee to be a professional member of the staff running the housing subcommittee Mm. for the Congresswoman who was chairing that position, chairing that committee. And um, once she retired, I went to work for the person that took over as chairman of the committee, Mike Oxley from Ohio, ultimately worked for several other chair chairmen and ranking members, um, Spencer Bacchus, as well as um, um, Henserling. 
before I left in 2011. I really wasn't looking for a job. I love working on the Hill, love the institution, love the work. I'm a real mm -hmm. policy wonk. So I like digging into the weeds and learning about an issue and then helping to get legislation over the finish line. Um, but um, I was approached by an MHC back in 2011 and uh, they asked me if I'd be interested to coming to work for them. Um, and again, really wasn't looking for a job, but you know, they say that when you, uh, easiest thing to do is to find a job is when you've got a job. So mm -hmm. anyway, I went through a long process, you know, six different interviews and all kinds of things, but ultimately, um, ended up deciding that this would be a good fit. And what I will say is that, um, I, most of my background and most of Washington's background for that matter, you know, they focus a lot on single family. Mm -hmm. And so multifamily is, is um, there's not as many experts in the field, shall we say, um, about multifamily in Washington. Um, I think sometimes it's interesting to, to understand that for Congress, they're, when they are dealing with the rental industry, they're, they're looking at you know, Section 8, HUD budgets. So they don't understand the, um, you know, the workings to the extent that they do the single family. So mm -hmm. um, I felt like it was, I had to learn the industry and I also had to spend a good deal of time and focus on um, helping to educate Congress once I got to NMHC. And that kind of became my goal was to, to educate members of Congress and the you know the various administrations on what the multifamily industry was, you know what the business was like, um, that it wasn't all just about Section Eight and subsidized housing. It mm -hmm. was a business. So, so before we dive in too deep, I'm I'm curious. It sounds like you're in your banking committees and and certainly in the financial world of the of the system back in, in 2008, right? In the global financial crisis, great financial crisis. Yep. Um, I'm curious, given your seat going through that and early in the pandemic, you know, last year, a lot of parallels were drawn between what happened then and what happened in, in 2020, obviously very different um, cause of those, some similar, uh, you know, behaviors, I guess, in the financial markets and the housing markets. I'm, I'm just curious maybe what that experience was like back in 08 from, from your seat. What did you learn from that? And then did you see any parallels or anything that you were able to kind of draw on from that experience and what we went through last year? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it was a it, it was a different crisis back in 2008 mm -hmm. than we mm -hmm. just went through in the pandemic. But certainly there are always um, um, parallels that you can draw from. Um, you know, that was a boy uh, that was a very tumultuous time back in 2008. Mm -hmm. The industry. Um, you know, it was, I will tell you, it was a very intense time, shall we say. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think we all learned that there were many things that were done back in those days that perhaps set some of those things in motion, you know, no down payment loans, you know, mostly on the single family side. And I like to always make the point that, you know, um, we weren't part of the meltdown in many respects um, back in those days. Um, but um um, you know, I think um, the, the with the pandemic, I will say that um, it it it, recreate, it it caused us to really have to kind of rethink everything. I mean, mm -hmm. as as NMHC, we focus on a number of important issues, obviously. But when the pandemic came along, it became much more about you know addressing um, how was our industry going to um, survive through the mm -hmm. pandemic with, you know, protracted eviction moratoriums and, and, you know, folks um, losing their jobs and many of the people who, who reside in our residence, you know, um, feeling the, the hurt of the pandemic and suffering financial loss from the pandemic. So we really had to very much shift and shift our focus and become very much, um, laser focused on how we were going to help the industry. And um, I, I feel like the parallels between 2008 and the pandemic were similar from that standpoint. I mean, mm -hmm. we really had to reevaluate everything 
and figure out how to move forward. And so very focused on, um, first of all, back even before the CARES Act, we thought that it was important to establish a rental assistance fund mm -hmm. that would help our members and also to push strongly for um, the additional benefits for unemployment and expanded unemployment benefits, the stimulus checks, and the PPP program, because we felt that those were the kinds of things that were going to help our residents meet their financial ob obligations, one of them mm -hmm. being rent. And so we hit the ground running and started advocating for those specific issues and also a number of, of tax related issues as well that would, you know, pretty much shore up our, uh, our industry. Um, and we, I will say that I, it's, it's one of the, some of the most rewarding work I've ever done. You mm -hmm. know, the, the 2008 situation was, was, um, it's hard. To, I mean, I still, um, think back, it was very, very, um, I, I think we were still trying to figure out how to fix all those things back in there. And I think, um, but I feel like this pandemic um, and what we did here on the pandemic really was significant and mm -hmm. excellent for the industry. I mean, to get over 50, almost 50,000, 50 billion in rental assistance secured for the industry was a, was a really monumental feat. Yeah. And we definitely want to dig into some of that legislation, the merit, the rescue plan, and, and certainly some news just came out of California with rental assistance. Um, but yeah. before we get into that, I'm just, I'm so curious, what does, what does a day in your life look like when you're, when you're working with legislators, um, in your position now, you know, what's changed maybe from before, what does that look like? Uh, are any two days the same? Like, I'm, I'm just so curious. What, They're not. What you're... <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing about it because I mean, just look at today, the Supreme court ruled on the, um, FHFA director today. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So that sets me off in a motion. You know, I need to write a story, need to get it out to our members, need to think through what that means. So every day that, it, you know, anything can pop up. Last night, there was a story on Reuters where um, the administration was considering a one month um, um, extension of the moratorium, the eviction moratorium. Well, you can imagine when I saw that story, I'm like, oh, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to reach out to a, a number of people over at the administration and see if they've made a decision, see what I could do to, to make our case known that we really think that the eviction moratorium needs to be allowed to expire come mm -hmm. June 30th. So um, it, 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 oftentimes you are driven by the events of the moment and that, and you have to be very nimble and you have to be very flexible. But Which, again, that that's from, from, again, from a very much outsider's perspective, there's this you know, I think this kind of impression that things just take so long in in Congress and, and through the political system, but it sounds like that's quite different from from what you're having to react to on such short notice. Uh, is the velocity of these issues that come up, it seems, I mean, that seems like that's a pretty real-time reactive, uh, fast-paced environment, it, contrary it, to what I might feel like look it like is. from the outside. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a perfect example yesterday, for example, you know, I went into the office, you know, certainly, you know, was working on trying to figure out what is going to be the decision on the eviction moratorium, reaching out to a number of people over at the administration, talking to people on the Hill, seeing if they can weigh in. And then I actually went to three or four different events last night where I was able to see, you know, seven or eight senators and, you know, talk to them about the infrastructure package, talk to them about taxes, which we have concerns about, you know, some of the provisions that the, the administration is considering for pay-fors and infrastructure. So, you know, you have to look for your moments and you have to um, navigate, you know, how mm -hmm. you can create moments so that you can get out and make your case on behalf of the industry. And now having, so I think you said it was 2011 uh, when you joined NMHC, so this would be your third administration, I guess, that you've, you've been working in that role through. Mm -hmm. um, how, how has that changed? I mean, going through administrations, going through, uh, you know, certainly elected representatives, what, maybe what's, what's consistent throughout that? And then what's, what's different about that from when you first started? Well, like I said, when I started in an MHC, I really felt that we sh we needed to do a good job of explaining the industry to um, policymakers. Um, as I've said, I've 
it's a it's a single family town. Everybody understands the single family market. Everybody mm -hmm. is engaged in the single family. Everybody writes about the single, does research. But multifamily is a little bit different. And so um, I think that we have done, I, I'd like to think that we've done a great job over the last several years of really educating both policymakers and the administration, as well as up on Capitol Hill about, about the industry. Mm -hmm. And also setting ourselves up so that we have the ability to, to that we're, we're seen as a resource, that we're seen as, you know, an, a, a, an industry that can provide um, good information. I mean, let's face it, when you're a lobbyist, you're, you're only as good as the information that you can provide to members and whether or not your information is reliable. And, and so I think we have one of the best staffs um, in Washington, to be honest with you. And uh, um, we do a lot of, um, you know, work trying to make sure that people understand how things actually work. I, I often mm -hmm. say this, I color my hair, um, so it's really gray. Um, but I was there in 1986 on Capitol Hill when they passed the tax reform package that pretty much put the industry out of business. And pretty much that happened at like at a three o'clock in the morning type of thing when they made some decisions on passive loss and all that. And so the key to advocating on behalf of your industry is to make sure that you are having those conversations so that when those decisions are made, and I think um, by three or four people in a room, mm -hmm. you've you've been able to at least get to them and explain you know, who you are, how that might impact you. And so we do a lot of work. And if you ask me how things have changed, look, the whole the whole um, the way things are done has has changed. I mean, it used to be my job when I worked on the Hill to sit down and cut that deal with the other side of the aisle. And nobody ever, nobody got what they wanted. Nobody got everything they wanted, but you moved the ball forward. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it seems um, over the years that we are far less about policy <laughs> and moving the, the ball forward for the country and way more about politics. And maybe that's mm -hmm. just the cynic in me. But um, regardless, even though that seems to be where we are today, um, you still have to be able to see the people that you want to see, explain to them, you know, a perfect example, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, later, but infrastructure. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, getting in there and talking to folks about the infrastructure package, what's important for our industry, you know, what the impact of um, the pay force would be on our industry. I mean, you have to have those relationships up on the hill so that you can can get to those folks and explain what, you know, how this might impact what they're considering. Your right, to make sure that they've got all, yeah. all the information they can when they're making those, those decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit then about the current environment. Um, some recent policy changes, legislation, again, we mentioned the American rescue plan. Um, California just recently announced that they're going to use some of those, I think federal funds to maybe pay some of that back rent for, for people, you know, residents that are behind mm -hmm. in the rent. Um, I think there was certainly an impression with the eviction moratoriums, which you mentioned, that the the owners of the real estate were maybe kind of left behind in that thought process, right? Um, you know, how, how does this affect them paying taxes, paying their mortgages when they're not getting the rent payments? Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about some of the current policy changes, things that we've seen over the last year, mm -hmm. um, and maybe some of the things that you're looking at, sure. uh, maybe coming down the line. Sure. So look, we really felt, as I mentioned, that one of the most important things that we could do is create a um, rental assistance program. And we started working on that long before the CARES Act was even passed. And we weren't able to get a provision in the CARES Act, but we were able to get it over the finish line on the second stimulus package. Mm -hmm. And that was a $25 billion rental assistance program. And that rental assistance program, you know, it went through many iterations. We were most um, anxious to have it set up in a way that would ensure that landlords would be um, part of that program. And so the rental assistance program that is in existence today is paid directly to 
landlords. Um, I don't, uh, it, it is set up um, so that each state gets a certain amount of money and then the state sends it out to um, others to administer the program at the state and local level. And so um, we have been very much engaged from day one in trying to make sure that the specifics of that program are such that um, our members are getting those funds and also mm -hmm. in a position to help residents who are in need to, to, to get those funds. So um, we've been in constant contact with Treasury um, and we've been engaged on you know, the FAQs that they've been putting out, the guidance that they've been putting out. Um, you saw in California initially when the first program w went up that they were going to require haircuts for the industry. And, and then they kind of backtracked on that. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to think that we've had some, some you know, some um, success in, in helping states and some of the localities understand, you know, what, what's going to work in terms of these program and what's not going to work. And so um, we've been very much engaged in that. And then the second program as well there's a second tranche of money, which is 25.6. So I think a total of 46.6 or something like that in rental assistance. And I would say that it's been difficult um, initially to um, get the programs up and running. Mm -hmm. um, California being one of them, <laughs> it's taken a while to kind of define how they're going to get that money out the door. But um, I think you're beginning to see now, and I think you'll see in the next several months, a, a better flow of that money to the to the landlords. And that was one of the things that we really worked hard on to make sure that people understood that this, that, that our, our members were hurting, that they had mortgages to pay, they had taxes to pay, they had utility bills to pay. And so a lot of what you see in this program, being able to pay utility bills and things like that, and, and just uh, make trying to make it simpler um, so that it could be executed. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a perfect program and it's a government program, <laughs> 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 which on a good on a good day is a problem. But um, yeah, I mean, we're very we're very happy that it's that it's that that program exists and we work yeah, hard it, on it. And I was going to ask, I mean, how how involved are you or, or are you involved in the actual implementation of that? I mean, that's that has to be a logistical nightmare to try to figure out how to get almost $50 billion into the hands of people that yeah, need it yeah. in this industry, right? And, and particularly when you're looking at our members who have daily jobs of leasing and all those things. Mm -hmm. And now they're also in the business of helping their residents identify where those funds are and then also securing them. And I think if you talk to some of our, um, our members, you'll hear how much time they are spending. We have one, we had a, we did a panel in uh, California on the rental assistance program. We had several um, um, presenters and it was interesting to listen to just what these folks are going through. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's one of our panelists who talked about the fact that they have looked at over like 260 different programs and each program has different requirements. Wow. And so to determine, you know, and, and, you know, trying to orchestrate and facilitate these, these funds getting in the hands, you know, getting in their hands um, has been, a whole new uh, level of um, work for mm -hmm. each one of our companies that are involved in this. I can imagine. I mean, it's a it's a full time staff of multiple people just to make sense of all of it, right? Right, right. Um, so you mentioned just again earlier news out of the current administration about an extension of that that eviction moratorium. Um, you know, are there other policies or things that are going on that maybe aren't as uh, high up in the news right now that people, again, a lot of our listeners are investors in multifamily assets and commercial real estate generally. And then we have another a whole subset of our listeners that are managers and, and sponsors of, of these properties themselves. Um, anything 
that they should be thinking about or paying attention to that's maybe not as high up on that radar as some of the, you know, the, again, eviction moratoriums being one of the, the most key uh, points sure. of conversation today? Mm -hmm. Sure. Just, just to give you a feel for some of the other things that we get involved in, um, we are very much engaged in the technology side of things and in um, broadband and in um, um, telecom related issues. Um, many of our members, you know, are obviously the most, one of the most important um, things our residents rely on is access to, to internet access, mm -hmm. you know, connectivity. And so we're engaged in those issues on a variety of levels. Um, and, and, and then we spend a good deal of time on that <laughs> with the FCC and others. Um, uh, we also are involved in, um, risk related management issues, insurance issues, not the national, you know, re we're, we're pushing for and looking for reforms in the national flood insurance program, mm -hmm. which is, um, very, very important to many of our members, as well as, um, back in the day being involved in TRIA, um, which is was risk insurance um, for terrorism. And we're also working on um, a pandemic risk insurance proposal for, mm -hmm. God forbid, the next pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, you know, working on, um, you know, cybersecurity issues and privacy issues. We collect a good deal of of um, personal information. And so how our companies are required to deal with privacy issues and deal with that, that information is important to us. And so we've been engaged in the conversations on what a privacy policy would look like at the federal level. Right mm -hmm. now, I think we're pretty much all operating under what California's privacy laws are. So we're very much engaged in that issue. Um, we also um, pay attention to a lot of the sustainability. And as you can imagine, this administration is very, very, very focused on climate. Mm -hmm. And many of the um, sustainability issues, the energy efficiency issues, the building code issues are things that we are involved in and that are important to the industry. Okay. Um, well, I know that's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> um, you know, are there any... Are there any resources or any areas that listeners can yes. get some aggregate info around yes. this? I mean, again, that's a, that's a lot to keep track of, yes. right? <laughs> so <laughs> what I would say is go to our website. Um, we um, have a one-pager that kind of defines our top-tier issues, mm -hmm. many of which are the ones that I've just talked about, you know, credit screening, credit um, um, credit and criminal screenings, you know, flood insurance, um, housing affordability. Housing affordability is also an overarching issue for mm -hmm. all of the things we are involved in. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're very much focused on trying to help um, um, find solutions to our housing uh, affordability crisis ac across the country. So we have incredible resources. Each one of those issues that I've mentioned, if you go to our website, we have a fact sheet, a one-page fact sheet on each one of those issues. Great. And we also have a one-pager that just gives a brief history of each one of those history. It's a one or two sentence. And then we have um, our research and other issues that back up a lot of those issues. So um, our, our website is a, is a great resource. I will vouch for that. And we'll have links in the show notes to all those as well. Great. So definitely, uh, mm -hmm. go, go check those out. Um, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about infrastructure. Um, that's obviously a big focus of current administration. I think there was roughly 200 billion plus or minus in, in housing funds specifically. 213. Um, 213 billion. <laughs> yep. Not, not that you're, uh, keeping, yep. keeping too close an eye okay. on that. Um, so I know you had mentioned that you know housing is infrastructure. Infrastructure is housing, right? They're they're very very closely linked. Um, how does the current plan affect housing? I guess both yeah. single family, but, more folk, more, yeah. more more yeah. specifically multifamily, of course, yeah. um, and, and generally more. Yeah. I guess the commercial real estate investment world. What are you guys seeing there? Yeah, well, let's let's let's. That's, that's something, first of all, I will say to you that we've been working on for several years. I mean, most of these issues don't get over the finish line in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, we, we maintain that housing is infrastructure. And that is an issue that we've worked on over the last couple of years. 
um, Maxine Waters, who is the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, reached out to us, you know, a year or two ago and asked for some assistance in working on her housing as infrastructure package. And what she is looking at is how do you incentivize states and localities to streamline their processes? As we know, a lot of the costs to development, preservation, um, are at the state and local level relative to regulations and um, permitting processes and all of that. So um, we think, and we one of the things that we've been working hard to get across uh, to many of the policymakers is that we believe that there are ways that you can incentivize states and localities to streamline their processes, to eliminate some of the barriers to development and to, to um, um, preservation and yeah, of, of properties. So um, for example, um, what Mrs. Waters bill does is say, if you want CDBG funds, for example, you'll get extra points if you're thinking through how you can streamline your permitting processes and your, mm. your regulatory processes in a community that perhaps might not want to build housing <laughs> for some reason or particular types of housing, um, they may not see seek out those federal housing dollars. So we're also trying to make the point that you can incentivize states and localities by also attaching some of those incentives to transportation dollars because mm -hmm. it's very um, um it's 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 most most states and localities want those transportation dollars. So, look, I, I think it remains to be seen whether or not um, what will happen to the two hundred and thirteen billion that the administration has put forth um, that is housing related that they want as part of this infrastructure package. But I think that if you look at, I mean, I think it's pretty much understood that maybe the bipartisan package will not have any housing. But I think what's important for us to remember is that quite often we are asked as an industry to pick up the tab and to pick up the cost of lots of the crumbling infrastructure around our mm -hmm. communities when we're building mm -hmm. at the state and local level. So any amount of investment in infrastructure is going to be important for the industry and going to be helpful to us. And we also think that there are ways if that, that, as I just mentioned, that states and localities, even without large dollars, housing dollars being included, you could work to incentivize states and localities um, on infrastructure projects to, to say, hey, look, you know, um, do the things that need to be done to streamline the processes so that we can build more, we can develop more, we can address, you know, the, the lack of supply for mm -hmm. the housing. Hey listeners, Tyler here with a quick note. If you're looking for a simple way to learn about commercial real estate investing, then head to realcrowduniversity.com to enroll in our free course. That's realcrowduniversity.com. We hope to see you there. And now back to Adam. And I will say, having spent most of my life in Oregon and California in the real estate industry, uh, there are certainly lots of uh, <laughs> regulatory zoning permitting challenges to to building new, and in which you know construction costs and materials aside, it is a very large component of this affordable housing issue. So it sounds like the the focus of these funds and these programs would be yes, updating, improving infrastructure around our, our country, but more specifically, is, is this an attempt to, to try to impact this affordability issue? Is that, yes. is that the underlying push? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I mean, that's... I mean, look, you know it as well as I do. The, the additional costs associated with the things that we're asked to pay for add to the cost of a unit, mm -hmm. add to mm -hmm. the cost of rent. So, yes, you know, we think that there are ways that... Um, states and localities can incentivize greater development can and and we're particularly interested in one of the proposals that the administration has put forth that has a five billion dollar grant fund I think it's a grant I'm sorry don't quote me on that but that would um, um, if you're willing to address some of the inclusionary zoning um, hurdles mm -hmm. so we're certainly talking to the administration about that as well how much do you think policy can affect affordability? Oh, 
<laughs> I am, I'm kind of putting you on the spot there. <laughs> I'm an optimist, okay? I, I will tell you, uh, when I worked on the Hill, and even today, I mean, there are solutions to these problems. It's just politics gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So that's frustrating to me at times, because I think some of us know that there are real solutions that we could put in place to address some of these issues. But Ooh, um, but I'm 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 optimistic. I'm optimistic. Um, NMHC um, is helping to spearhead a real estate coalition um, that is really trying to identify um, ways to address the afford new ways. You know, we've got you know, trying to identify new ways that we might address housing affordability. Okay. And I do any think of those that you can you can share. I'm I'm curious. I mean, again, what it, what is are there well, I mean, look, I mean, there's, there's, there's the, the federal government has a, a, a complement of land and properties they own. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we could we could look at ways to repurpose that, you know, um, there's tax breaks that we could look at that. I mean, one of the things that we support is a um, middle income housing tax cre credit, mm -hmm. which is similar to what we have already, which is the low income housing tax credit. But this would really help incentivize greater development at that middle income level. Um, we think there's uh, tax credits to re repurpose properties, also hotels, you know, um, and address that would that would be designed to address affordability. So there's things that we could do that would move us in that director. So we're trying to identify a lot of those um, those types of programs that might help to move the needle on affordability. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it has to do with NIMBYism. Part of it has to do with, you know, states and localities have to, you know, they say they want more affordable housing, but sometimes, you know, the policies don't, you know, lead you to believe that that's really what they want. So mm -hmm. um, we're, we're just trying to be part of the conversation. And then is there anything, obviously early days in the current plan, um, as proposed, is there anything that would be investors or, or operators should be looking at that would maybe negatively impact the space in the infrastructure plan? Anything to look I, out think, for? I, I think we continue to be concerned about some of the things that are being considered as pay fors. I mean, mm -hmm. 1031 exchange, we believe is a incredibly valuable um, tool for the industry. Yeah, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll dig um, into that a little and, bit here. <laughs> yeah. And I think that there's also some, you know, I think that's what we're focused on right now is is making sure that people understand the implications for some of these these dis, these uh, policies that are being considered. And when you say pay for, is that's basically how where are these funds coming from? What is pay, actually paying for these new policies? Right, right, yeah, right. Um, and so, since you brought it up, the ten thirty one exchange, we would be remiss if we didn't explore that a little bit more. Um, what's the latest? Where where, where does that Look, stand? If um, I had to, obviously, if I had to bet on this, I, I, I kind of in my heart of hearts feels that the 10 feel that the 1031 exchange might be okay. You know, it might not it it, it uh, it's because this isn't the first time it's been no. up for discussion. Listen, right? This is this has happened a lot in the past. In 2017, when they passed the tax reform bill, it was on the chopping block. And we had to do a lot of work. We commissioned several research studies with our other colleagues in the real estate industry. We worked very hard to make sure that people understood the importance of this. We have just done, um, you know, in, in anticipation of what was coming, we um, reconstituted two, two new studies, a couple new studies that would provide us the the numbers that we think are important for members to understand and know about the importance of the 1031 exchange to the industry. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I don't know. Again, we are making our way right now through meeting with you know many of the members of Congress on the Democrat side and the Republican side just to make our case on the 1031 exchange. I mm -hmm. think um, this is a numbers game, and I think. Um, the margins in both the Senate and the House may make it difficult for them to to make some of these wholesale, you know, changes to some of these uh, provisions. Um, but I, mm -hmm. I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I don't know, I'm feeling pretty good about 1031 exchanges. <laughs> <laughs> um, I may I, not be know, feeling as well of... about some of the others, but this one yeah. I'm feeling good about. <laughs> So I think a couple of things that we've seen are both a a cap on how much could be eligible yeah. for the ten thirty one. Yeah, five hundred for uh, single and a million for married. Right? It's, I think that's the yep. way it works. And, and we've certainly been making uh, that income. point that 
Yikes. That would, that would really put a damper on the, on the utility of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and again, as we've said, this isn't the first time that, that 1031s have been on the chopping block. Um, that would be a pretty major change to see that yeah. restricted or go. I mean, I don't think it's going to go away entirely. Right. But, um, to have, have that reined in, I think would be a pretty big impact. And, um, a lot of folks out there are doing what you guys are doing to, to make that known. Right. Certainly we are. All, we're all, I think, uh, we're very focused on that. We're working with our other colleagues. You know, one of the things <clears throat> that we do is we, we band together with, um, our other real estate colleagues and work on these issues collectively. Um, we had a coalition with 12 different um, real estate groups that has been very focused on not only getting the rental assistance over the finish line, but also mm -hmm. educating the um, industry. I mean, the policymakers on the eviction moratorium, same thing on some of the tax issues, particularly 1031 exchange. We, we worked together with our colleagues over at um, the real estate round table and MBA and the realtors, and the home builders, you know, making the case together and speaking with one voice on the importance of some of these issues. Mm -hmm. So taking a step back again for listeners of this right now, um, how close should investors in multifamily and, and operators of multifamily, um, how close should they be paying attention? What are some of the ways that they can get involved? And, and again, obviously with the resources you guys put out, um, what's the best way for them to have an influence or impact on where some of these, these policies go? Well, I'm going to tell you, there is nothing better than for a member of Congress or a policymaker to hear from their constituents. Does that actually work? Yes. Yeah. It matters. Um, I was out yesterday <laughs> Um, and I don't hesitate before I go meet with a member to find who is that person that's a constituent? Who's that person that I can bring up that that person's going to know <laughs> because it matters. Um, so look, you've got, you know, I think it's important to be engaged, particularly on things important to this industry, um, um, to reach out to your member of Congress, to talk to them about how these policies will impact you because there's no better advocate than a constituent. So I would, I'm, I'm a big advocate of saying as, a, as an individual, be engaged. And particularly mm -hmm. if, if you are working in an industry, be engaged um, and be an advocate because it, it does matter when they Perfect. hear from the people at home. I like that. That's a good, that's a good, again, an optimistic view that, that it does, it does matter, mm -hmm. which is good to hear. That's still a good thing. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so again, we'll have links in the show notes, obviously to NMHC. Um, you all provide a, a huge amount of data, phenomenal resource. Um, obviously recommend everybody that's listening, go check out the information that you all put out. Um, and then as we wrap up, Three kind of quick questions. Um, first off, what, what's keeping you up at night, either in just the industry in general, what you're seeing from a policy perspective, um, you know, as we, we go in the second half of 2021 here through the bulk of the pandemic, um, what are some of those points of concern through the remainder of this year, maybe look into 2022? You know, I, I am concerned that, um, Things like eviction moratoriums um, will be used to solve problems. You know, I mean, this one was used to to address the health crisis, but what's to stop eviction moratoriums and and other types of um, provisions like that to, to being implemented to address other of our of our problems like housing affordability. And I think I worry about um, the narrative that we are um, sometimes caught in about, you know, oh, well, the, the industry can afford to pick up the tab here on this and this. And then it's, it's almost like it's, it's, it's a crime to, to, to make a profit. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. we are the folks that are going to help um, address the affordable crisis. So we are the developers, the preserve, you know, the people that are preserving. And, 
And I, I, I hope that we can change the narrative a bit um, because I don't think we're the bad guys that oftentimes the media mm -hmm. makes us out to be. So that concerns me. It concerns me that um, we might be seeing more use of things like eviction moratorium, like rent cancellation, like, and that people don't understand the importance that um, maintaining this asset class and the, the viability of it and the attractiveness of it, how important that is to addressing our housing needs in the future. Okay. Does that make sense? You've, does that make it sense? Does. It, yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. And again, I think, you know, we mentioned that before. I think the, and rightfully so, a lot of the focus was on the renters, right? It was on the tenants. How do we make sure that people can survive through this, this challenge that was um, devastating through, through the last year? But I did, like to your point, I don't know that it felt like the the owners of the property, the landlords, you know, they can just foot the bill, yeah. right? Yeah. The yeah. the impact of that wasn't necessarily played out all the way upstream, and I think that's what you had mentioned at the core of NMHC is bringing that bringing that information, bringing that whole perspective to light to the policymakers, so that when those decisions are made, there is a more right. fulsome understanding of of what those longer tail impacts will be. Uh, and how that'll affect the the bigger picture um, with the focus. I, I think it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I think that yeah. I think it's crucial, and I, I think we continue to make the case that you want to address the housing affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. It's got to continue to be a viable asset class to 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 invest in. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so you mentioned a couple optimism, uh, you know, a couple points of optimism. I guess what uh, what are you most excited about here in the future of uh, multifamily? Look, we have a great industry and we have great people involved in this industry. I'm, I feel lucky every day to work with the members in, in uh, the industry. Um, and so I think that th I'd like to think that there is an ability for us to um, make sure that people understand just how many um, great people work in this industry and that they're doing great things. And so... Um, I'm energized every day that, um, um, and, and when I look at how we've gotten through the pandemic relative to the rent tracker that you mentioned and others, um, um, I think there's there's an opportunity for, for really good things to happen. And I hope that, the, that we can once and for all um, start to address some of the barriers that um, um, prevent us from addressing you know, the shortages that we have today in the mm -hmm. rental industry. So I'm, I'm encouraged. I feel like, Good. you know, got to be optimistic. Okay, have to be. Well, Cindy, this is uh, absolutely fascinating. Again, really, really appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, what do you let listeners know again, how they can learn more about what you and, and the NMHC are up to? So I would uh, tell you to sign into our website. There's a wealth of inf inf information there. Lots of great um, material on the individual issues that we work on on a daily basis on behalf of the industry. Plus there's research, great research and um uh, would just any time I can be a resource. I hope people won't hesitate to give me a call. Um, I'd be happy to to talk through any of the issues on um, that we work on and to 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 be a resource. Perfect. And 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 write your representatives. Call them. Let them know Absolutely. what you're thinking. Get engaged and vote. Get engaged. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Cindy, again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we'll have links down the show notes to, to all of that information. And again, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Listeners, I hope that was uh, as interesting for you as it was for me. I know this is, again, a, an inside look at what goes on behind the scenes. So we hope you enjoyed the show. Um, if you have any comments, questions, feedback, send us a note to podcast at realcrowd.com. And with that, we'll catch you on the next one.